2020 has been a momentous year for science and global health. It sounds like a mind-bending problem. Increased understanding and awareness of the interconnections between humans and planet Earth has never been more pertinent. It feels magical here. And Irish research is helping drive us towards a brighter, better world. It's ingenious technology. This week on 10 Things to Know About, we're seeing the light from the mysterious and stunning wonders of the natural world. Oh, this is so cool. To shining a light on life-saving medical treatments. From sunsets and rainbows, to the blues and greens of the ocean, to the remarkable range we see in plants and animals, the most vivid experiences of light and color come from what we see in nature. I've come here to Loch Hine in West Cork, where the extraordinary light of the natural world comes truly alive at night. Nisha Kennedy is a guide with Atlantic Sea Kayaking and he's kindly agreed to take me out in the water as dusk begins to fall to see what all the fuss is about. And we're off. Nisha, this is absolutely breathtaking. Well, you picked a great night for it, Jonathan. One of the best. I can't tell you how exciting it is to be on Loch Hine at night. It's just absolutely beautiful here. It what is... makes it so special? Like, what, why, why do people flock to this place and this part of the world? Well, first of all, I suppose during the day, it's a very safe place to swim. It's a saltwater lake. Uh, it's Europe's only saltwater lake, and it's a marine reserve as well. It was Europe's first marine reserve. It's well protected, and all the animals here are looked after. You know, there's no fishing, nothing like that. But the other thing is that it's home to a very particular type of microorganism. Tell me, tell me what we're hoping to see today. So tonight we're hoping to see bioluminescent plankton. And so it'll be emitting a little blue light when we disturb the water. And it looks a little bit like sparks. So the Irish word for it is crushnafariga, which means embers of the sea. Often too small to see with the naked eye, plankton are tiny plants and animals that are carried along by tides and currents in the water and provide food to a wide variety of species. So I'm pushing my paddle through the water now and I don't see anything. Why is that? And that's because it's not dark enough yet. It has to get a good bit darker. August and September usually is the perfect time of year. And with this calm night, a bit of cloud cover, we have no full moon, so we have perfect conditions for seeing it. So Jonathan, it's starting to get dark now. Uh, if it's okay with you, we're gonna turn our lights off it's just so it's we have complete darkness and we'll be able to see the bioluminescence. Ah. <laughs> Look at that. So we're just trying to disturb the water. So this plankton, it lights up because of, as a defense mechanism. So when you're disturbing it, it thinks you're trying to eat it. And it's lighting up to try and attract something bigger to come and eat you. Ah, oh, this is so cool. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, that was a truly unforgettable, magical experience. But behind that magic is some fascinating science. Researchers have been studying the area around Loch Hine since the late 19th century. And today I'm here to meet Dr. Tom Doyle, a marine biologist from University College Cork. Tom. Tell me what it is that causes the bioluminescence that we see here in Loch Hine. It's a single-celled organism called Noctiluca scintillans. Within that cell, you've got hundreds of thousands of these little vacuoles, and it, inside each of those, you have these chemicals. One's the luciferin, and the other is luciferase. And the two of those together, um, with oxygen, can produce light. And it, what's incredible is that it, it's an organism that does it. So if you think about it, it is a bit like a, the organism has a superpower so it can produce its own light. 
you know, when you look at plankton here, we've got the water here flowing by us. It's full of plankton. You've got phytoplankton in it, which are the plant cells. And then you've got the zooplankton, which are the animal little single-celled organisms. But Noctiluca is somewhere in between because it behaves like an animal, but its, it's uh, evolutionary history is more like a plant. How does it behave like an animal? It can't photosynthesize. So what it does is actually it feeds on other phytoplankton or feeds on other zooplankton. So it's actually it's, it's quite a predator. And actually it's one of the reasons why I like Noctiluca is that it has a tentacle. I work a lot on jellyfish and this guy has a little tentacle as well. So a kind of a bit of an honorary jellyfish in some ways, but it's only, it's really, really small. They're only half a millimeter. The Noctiluca is trying to protect itself and that's why it's emitting that light. Often when we see it, you see it on a, on a beach where the waves are breaking and it's got all the Noctiluca in the water. And it's that physical uh, or mechanical stress on the cells that actually cause it to emit light. It's because they can't, they can't see. So they can't tell the difference between uh, you know, any turbulence in the water or, you know, a boat going through the water as well. People think of bioluminescence as being something unusual, but it's actually the default for animals in the sea, isn't it? In coastal waters here, like in Loch Ain, bioluminescence is quite, quite rare or unusual. But if we go into our open water or the deep sea, yes, bioluminescence is really abundant. Maybe 70-80% of the organisms that are in that deeper water can actually bioluminesce. And the reason for that is light doesn't penetrate much below 200 meters. Yeah. So all these organisms are living in per perpetual darkness. So the only light is the light that they create. Bioluminescence, it's the dominant form of light in our oceans. Every night off offshore here, You've got this spectacular light show happening. All these organisms that are using light to capture food, are using light to be camouflaged, or else using light in some form of communications. Tell me about what goes on in possibly the most beautiful location for a lab I've ever seen. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really nice here. There's been marine research here for almost, almost 100 years. I do a lot of work on jellyfish, understanding what's happening with the different types of jellyfish species, what they're feeding on, what's feeding on them. We study the plankton, we study, you know, Noctilucas in there as well. I'm building a time series of plankton so that we can understand what's happening with our plankton with changing, changing climate. But then we've got PhD students, we've got other researchers that are actually diving here. So going on the water, looking at what's happening with sponges, what's happening in terms of the seaweeds. So there's, there's a huge amount of research that happens here in the lock. It's a really pristine environment, so it's just a, just a fantastic place to carry out research. Tom is part of a research group collecting samples from the lock, and we soon find out that there's a whole microcosm of life in the water. We're looking at a plankton sample through a stereoscope. So there's some crustaceans, there's some mollusks, there's lots of things whizzing around on the plankton sample there. But what we have in the middle there is, is Noctiluca and you can see that doesn't move. It's a busy place. It is, yeah, yeah. How big is this sample? How much water did you take out? We, we probably filtered about three or four cubic meters of water uh, when we were out there when we took a plankton sample. But I've just got a, I've just got a teaspoon of, of water no from the way. bucket here. So, so there's, there's just, it's incredible. It's unbelievable. And so how would you use this sample in your research? We're looking for particular species. We'd be counting Noctiluca, trying to understand if, if its abundance is increasing or decreasing. But we'd be also looking for harmful um, jellyfish species because we work with the aquaculture industry. And there's some species that can impact negatively on them. So we try to give them an indication of what's happening in the water. Bioluminescence is actually really important for medicine, isn't it, uh, Tom? And you're particularly interested in the, the crystal jellyfish. Yes, what's unusual about that one is that it, it emits a green light. And there's been lots of uh, studies over this, and actually a lot of the scientists that did the work on this over the last 30 years were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2008. But essentially what they've, ex they've extracted from the crystal jellyfish is a green fluorescent protein that emits this green light. And now you can actually use the genetic code of that and label molecules or whatever in, in, in different organisms that you're interested in or in different uh, systems that you're interested in. So you can tag different proteins 
and then it lights them up. So when you shine a light on it, you can actually see where that protein is being activated. This is the GFP protein? Yeah, the GFP protein, the green fluorescent protein. What's the difference between fluorescence and bioluminescence? Okay, with bioluminescence, it's a chemical reaction. Two molecules interacting together to produce light. But with fluorescence, you have to shine light on it for it to emit light, okay? So, and, and that's what the crystal jellyfish does, but it, it does it all within itself. It can bioluminesce, and then it, it emits this blue light, which Noctiluca does, but then that's absorbed by this green fluorescent protein, which then causes it to fluoresce this green light. It's quite remarkable to think that a glow-in-the-dark protein in a jellyfish is revolutionizing medical science. Just shows why we need that kind of blue skies research, because 30 years ago, when the researchers started looking at the crystal jellyfish and the bioluminescence in that and the fluorescence, nobody knew what could come down the road in, in 20, 30 years' time. So it just shows by looking at nature, we can learn a lot, and actually what we can get is we can get a lot of really useful tools as well, the more we look. Soldiers use infrared night vision goggles to see where enemies lie in wait. But the sea is home to a predator that has evolved its own means of simultaneously seeing, yet remaining unseen. Many marine animals use blue lights for bioluminescence, as blue light travels farthest in water, explaining why the ocean is blue and why many deep sea fish have lost the ability to see red light. But this colour blindness presents an opportunity to our particularly cunning predator. Enter the dragon, or more correctly, the stoplight loose jaw dragonfish. Named for its massive mousetrap like maw, the dragonfish attracts prey by initially producing blue light from light generating organs called photophores on its head. But in a colourful twist, it then absorbs some of this blue light into a fluorescent protein that it then re-emits as red light that only it can see. This gives the dragonfish sweeping red headlights, allowing it to stalk prey undetected by invisibly locating its next unsuspecting meal. Because at these depths, it's not a question of are you afraid of the dark, but rather you need to be afraid of the light. See you next time. Light has been used as a healing tool for decades, from treating skin conditions to therapies for seasonal affective disorder and jaundice. I'm in Cork to find out how photonics, or the science of light, is one of the key technologies of the 21st century. Professor Stefan Anderson Engels is a vice director of the Irish Photonic Integration Centre. So Stefan, what is photonics? So photonics is the type of technology we have that really uses photons to carry the signal. You can compare it with electronics that uses electrons to carry the signal. So, so that would be electrical current. Photonics then is light. And photonics is going to be, or is, one of the key technologies of the 21st century. It is. I would again like to compare it with electronics. That was the past century's big invention with integrated circuits that made computers and mobile phones and everything possible. Now we can have photonics integrated circuits. That means that you can combine photonic sensors and devices, communication systems, with electronics to make it really compact. And that means we, we will really revolutionize many things. As we saw earlier with the crystal jellyfish, the natural world provides fascinating examples of luminescence. And researchers are using that knowledge to develop light-based technologies with medical applications. We are working on several projects. One of the projects we are working on is to 
try to label tissue samples, biopsies from females mainly having breast cancer. So we are trying then to look at biomarkers, specific molecules that are generated on the surface of the, these cells to see whether we can label those. The research team at Tyndall are creating nanoparticles that when illuminated with laser light provide a specific luminescence signal used to detect cancer cells inside the human body. We wanted to differentiate breast cancer cells from the normal cells by using photoluminescence. In our case, we use uh, biomarkers, which are small, small, tiny particles. We target the cancer cells. When we get the target cells, we get different lights by using the microscope, so we can differentiate cancer cells than the normal cells. Nanoparticles are giving the bright signal on the microscope. There are loads of cancer cells here and here. As well as cancer treatments, researchers are developing light-based technologies to help monitor and improve care of our youngest and most vulnerable, our newborn babies. Chloe Kingston is a new mom from Cork. These are our twins, Paige and Nathan. We were fine the whole way through every appointment. They were delighted with them, delighted with their growth. Um, everything was fine, I was fine, and um, literally sitting at home on a Saturday night at half nine, I think it was, and just my waters broke. It was a very nerve-wracking car ride in, just not knowing what was ahead of us. They were born at 30 weeks. They were born uh, via section just because um, they were so small. He was ready to come, but she wasn't, so um, poor Paige had to come with him. They got oxygen straight away and they put them into, they called them little turkey bags just to keep their temperatures up. And they yeah, went on CPAP straight away um, and straight into their incubators and just down to the Neo. Pick lines put in for bloods and just lots and lots of checks. They're so small, so vulnerable. Uh, you don't really like people pulling and poking and prodding at them as it is, but obviously it has to be done. More than 50% of premature babies will experience breathing difficulties because their lungs aren't fully developed and cannot provide enough oxygen. During those first few weeks, the twins underwent X-ray imaging and daily monitoring of the air in their lungs. They were there for five weeks and two days. I spent all day, every day in there. My husband kept working as he said he'd take the time off when they came home and he'd come in the evenings. Then it was only one parent allowed in the Neo at a time. So we'd just swap over. But um, it was all worth it because they're fine. The Infant Centre in Cork is working with Tyndall to develop infrared light technology with the potential to reduce the use of x-rays and keep track of newborn babies' lungs in real time. We need light that penetrates through the body. Now I take my phone just to show you here. So if I put my finger here of the white light, what we can see from this is that light is heavily scattered. So you see very diffuse light coming out through my finger. But you also see very red light coming through. And that's because the blood, the hemoglobin in the blood, absorbs all other colors. The technology known as gas mass uses near-infrared laser light, which is scattered and absorbed as it travels through the body. When part of the light reaches the lungs, it causes the oxygen and water molecules inside the lungs to vibrate, creating a specific signal which can be detected and translated into a measurement of the oxygen concentration in the baby's lungs. What we are trying to do here is to have a lab equipment where we can try to mimic exactly what's going to happen in the clinic. So, so we're building basically a body with the lungs and all the components of the body in plastics that have exactly the same optical properties as the baby itself. And then we are measuring on that type of what we call tissue phantom to see whether we can measure the concentration of oxygen and the volume of oxygen in the lungs. So this is our gas mask system and we have a laser here and the laser is pointing to our phantom. So the phantom mimics what a baby would look like 
And the idea is that the light from the laser scatters through the baby. There's an empty cavity within our phantom here and the light will shine through that. It mimics the lungs and then the light will scatter out and hit the detector. And then we can look on our computer and see our signal and that will tell us how much oxygen is in the phantom. So this is an example of one of our phantoms, but it's clear. And we can show you how the light goes through it. So if we have our source on the outside and the light travels through, we can see what it looks like when it detects on the other side. Trials of the gas mask technology are due to begin in Cork University Maternity Hospital in 2021. And it's hoped the system will allow for safer, less invasive care and treatments for premature babies like Paige and Nathan in the future. Meanwhile, another area of health care that could be set for big advances is in the use of light to optimise existing ultrasound technology. So what we are trying to do is combine this ultrasound and, and light to be able to see molecules inside tissue and have a resolution of the ultrasound image. And that is, I mean, you can compare that with X-rays or MR images that we typically take today to see inside the body with high resolution. But none of those techniques have any molecular sensitivities. I can't feel what these molecules do you have inside the tissue. And this is what we can potentially do with light. That sounds kind of like magic. I mean, we are already, I'm already impressed by ultrasound and MRI and you see it scanning through the entire body and it's there you go. So now you're going to be able to see molecules that are within a particular tumour or a particular structure within the body. Yes. The first application maybe is to see the heart. A patient coming into the emergency room having chest pain, will that patient have a heart infarction or not? Obviously, they're taking many type of test on that, but one would be to actually visualize the heart and see how oxygenated is the heart muscle in different places, and then see if there is an infarction and how big that infarction that might be. And it's not just healthcare applications. The use of light is advancing a whole range of industries, from the renewable energy sector to communication technologies, including whatever device you're watching us on right now. So if I was an aspiring scientist looking for a career in the future, it sounds like photonics might be a place to keep an eye on. Absolutely. Photonics will be the next century's big revolution. and We have one of the best photonic centers in Europe. That's our 10 things to know about light. Next week, we're looking at the critical importance of biodiversity.